Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another edition of Mr. Merrigan's Moments in Geography. Today we're going to get into South Asia and in particular today we're going to start with India. So what we're going to be able to do today, we're going to be able to identify some of the physical geography that you'll find here, particularly the mountain ranges. We'll also get into uh, the culture and certainly with that its history, uh, including its independence from Britain and also certainly some of its uh, cultural attributes and, of course, its importance in faiths like Hinduism. So let's start with that physical geography of India. So India uh, in the north is marked by the Karakoram range as well as the Him Himalayas or the Himalayas. Um, the Himalayas are the youngest and also the fastest growing mountain range in the world. And, of course, within that mountain range is the highest mountain and the highest peak in the world, which would be Mount Everest, which is actually in Nepal. And we'll get to that when we talk about Nepal. So those kind of mark in the north as far as when we look at the map of India. In the eastern and western parts, you have the what are called the eastern and western, I've heard, Ghats as well as Ats. So both certainly um, could be correct there. You also certainly have the Deccan or the Deccan um, plateau, certainly in between. Uh, you'll also see here towards the middle, uh, you've got the um, Satapura range, which would be again right about here on the map. And then, of course, you've got the Ganges Plain, which is marked by the Ganges River. The Ganges River actually has some significance both in the physical geography and providing things like irrigation as well as opportunity for agriculture, but also spiritually. Uh, in Hinduism, the Ganges is considered quite sacred and is actually worshipped like a goddess uh, and has renewing spirits to it. And so certainly it has multiple significance within the Indian culture. Climate-wise, India is pretty warm and experiences warmed to hot temperatures pretty much year-round. Um, the Himalayas do play a role in that. They do block some of that colder northern air from reaching India, especially being such a large and uh, significant mountain range. They do have a rainy season, which typically takes place between June and September. So when this is being recorded in May, we're getting towards that season. Uh, in particular, a feature of that is something called the monsoons. And this is a seasonal wind that blows steadily, typically in the same direction. And it brings with it lots of precipitation and in some cases flooding. It brings, again, that warm, moist air. And again, that's coming off the Indian Ocean, uh, which certainly would be along the southern border of the subcontinent of India. Now, it's, you know, there's no denying that India is one of the largest populations in the entire world. There's somewhere around 1.2 billion people. But in order to see that growth, they had to be able to change the way they fed people. And that's where the Green Revolution comes in, in India. It starts in about the, the end of the 1940s. So they do produce most of the food which they need. Now, in order to do that, they had to change the way they grow crops. And one of the things that drove that was the unfortunate tragedy of the Bengal famine, which occurred in 1943, shortly after World War II. And remember that in World War II, India fought with Britain because at that point it was still a British colony. Uh, Four million people ended up dying uh, in this famine. So it, when India becomes independent in 1947, and shortly after, in that same time period, you also have Pakistan because we have to remember that Pakistan and India used to, when they were ruled by Britain, used to be part of the same territory. Uh, we'll get more onto that when we talk about Pakistan because that's a very important relationship. Um, but they needed to modernize the way they farmed, which increased their food production, or which would have needed them to increase their food production. <coughs> Excuse me. And that led to what we call the Green Revolution. They started to use dams for irrigation, multiple crops per year in order to combat, you know, diseases that might affect crops. They also improved uh, the varieties of wheat and rice and corn. We saw the introduction of more GMOs or gen genetically modified organisms into India. They're also the second largest producer of jute. 
Now, agriculture does play a significant role, but there are certainly industries that actually play a larger role in the economy. You know, and you guys can see here in the chart based on 2018 what some of those were. And again, you know, tourism is going to play a big role in that along with finances and property. <coughs> so industries include certainly manufacturing. You guys can see on the chart makes up a, a solid percentage, 18 percent. You're going to see cotton textiles as well as iron and steel, oil refineries. And also you're starting to see the service industry, which would also include tourism. But American computer companies are increasingly putting more of their customer service into India because you have a population of professional English speaking um, young people who can meet those needs in India. And so you're actually starting to see an increased presence of those companies in India. Uh, mining is also certainly a big one, coal, iron ore, bauxite, uh, as well as manganese. They also tend to export gems uh, as well as jewelry to other countries. Uh, and then they also certainly, because you have such a rural population, they also have what we call uh, cottage industries, which are industries on a kind of a smaller level, typically out of a home or a village-based production. And that might include things like cotton and silk cloth. Uh, certainly you'll see rugs as well as leather and metalware, which also plays a significant role, especially within the economy of India. Now, with all this growth, especially economic growth, but also population growth, you're going to experience some environmental issues. And because they have almost a sixth of the world's population living here, it makes sense that there are going to be some environmental issues. So with this growth, there have been challenges. You need more space. And so deforestation has begun to increase, which takes away habitat from like uh, Bengalese tigers and you know, the Indian elephant or the Asian elephant and uh, certainly other species have seen a decrease in their habitat. Uh, certainly pesticides have continued to grow, especially through the Green Revolution, which has, of course, uh, affected water quality. Certainly with all this industrialization, smog has also become an increasingly big issue. Uh, and including the Ganges, you've seen some pollution of certainly um, the rivers including the Ganges. So let's get into the history a little bit here. India and again, Pakistan um, certainly have had a history of civilization here for quite some time, dating back as far as 4,000 years ago. And at the time it would have been called the Indus River Valley. And certainly they've been conquered by a variety of different people. You know, they got the Aryans in around 1500 BCE you could certainly also bring up, um, this is kind of the extent to which Alexander increased the Macedonian Empire, certainly the Mongols, uh, but certainly have had a lot of um, history occurring here. And India has played a very significant role, especially when it comes to trade. India also, throughout its history, has had a pretty rigid social structure through something called the caste system, which has connections to its faith of Hinduism, uh, but certainly also a part of the social structure. And depending on what caste or class you were born into, that could affect the occupation you had, the way others treated you, the way you, you should treat others, and also just the general role that you're going to play in society. This is also certainly home to, you know, quite a few faiths. Uh, but the biggest one certainly would be Hinduism, which, depending on how you practice it, can be monotheistic or polytheistic. And Islam also certainly has a presence here. Remember, India and Pakistan have quite a history together. Uh, and there's, you know, over 140 million uh, Muslims living within India today. They did gain their independence from Britain in 1947, and a big component of that was their leadership. Mahatma Gandhi, who actually trained to be a lawyer in Britain, actually spent some time in South Africa, and then came back to India and led a nonviolent revolution uh, to restore Indian independence. And so uh, the Gandhi family has certainly played a significant role uh, in India's history since that time period. India is also the largest democracy in the world. They are a representative democracy with a president and a prime minister, and they do again, have a quite sizable population. There are over 1.2 billion people. Vast majority of that population does speak Hindi. 
Uh, 70% tend to live in more rural villages. And you've also seen the exporting of Indian culture, whether it's their food or their entertainment. Bollywood is probably, with their movies, is probably one of the biggest exports. Um, certainly music as well. And also certainly, you know, different ideas ranging from things like concept of yoga or um, in some ways, you know, things like meditation. Uh, certainly they've been adapted into countries like, say, the United States and Canada, uh, but certainly they uh, come from the tradition in India, although they look very differently. Make sure you check in the check-in quiz just to make sure you're grabbing those big key ideas. For my students, make sure you've been following with the guided notes or creating your own notes. Ask any questions that you have. For those who are just listening, I hope that we gave you at least an introduction to some of the history, some of the culture, and some of the physical geography of India. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. We'll see you next time.